Built in 1908, this two-story interlocking tower controls switches and signals on the once double-track main line as well as sidings. Because other towers in the area were built of modern cast concrete, as was par for the course in the Lackawanna's heyday, it's a rare example of a wood frame interlocking tower. The tower had 38 levers connected to switches and signals through a series of mechanical rods and cranks with the mechanically controlled semaphore signals being replaced by automatic color light signals in 1937. To this day, the signal circuits are housed in a small concrete relay house outside of the tower and the levers inside the tower continue to control the switches as well as the crossing gates on Anna Lamink Street. The Lackawanna began consolidating its tower functions in the 1930s as CTC gained popularity. The nearby Gravel Place Tower was closed in 1950 and its functions were transferred to East Stroudsburg with Slateford Junction being added to East Stroudsburg in 1951 when that tower was closed. In 1960, the Lackawanna merged with the Erie to form the Erie Lackawanna and on January 6, 1970, the last run of the Lake City's passenger train made the Erie Lackawanna a freight-only railroad. Conrail was created in 1976 and through service through East Stroudsburg ended in 1979 with the Pocono Main Line and the Lackawanna cutoff route sold to developers in the 1980s. The East Stroudsburg Railroad Tower Society was formed in 2005 to restore, maintain, and operate the tower as a museum. Volunteers have restored the tower and painted it to match how it might have looked when first built. The tracks are owned by the Pennsylvania Northeastern Regional Rail Authority and have been operated by the Delaware Lackawanna since 1993. The Tower Museum is open for special events and by appointment only. You can visit their website at esrrtower.org for more information. In a prior summer special video, we got to see current operations in the old Delaware and Hudson Green Ridge Yard. You learned that six axle diesel power was limited to the mouth of the yard, but it looks like that might have changed. Here's a video clip from one of the previous summer specials. I want you to pay close attention to where the locomotive is sitting right now, the track alignment. Now, it's kind of hard to tell from this particular vantage point, but I'll, I'll clear that up for you in a minute. But right now, I want you to pay attention to the locomotive and where it's sitting. This picture gives us a lot better look at that track alignment. Note the track to the right. That track to the right, that's the main line or what used to be the main line. And notice how it comes into what appears to be the yard track. Like I said, it was a really, really funky track alignment. I never understood why they did it this way, but that's how they did it. The track to the right, the old main line has been torn up, as you can see in this picture here. And you can also see getting close up, you can see where the switch used to be. About 124 EMD diesels are going bye-bye from the NS roster, including 48 SD60s, 53 SD60Ms, 21 SD60Is, and 2 MP15Es. Initially, NS had about 166 standard cab SD60s, 151 that were bought by NS, and 15 that came from Conrail. The NS SD60s were numbered from 6550 to 6700, the Conrail SD60s were numbered from 6702 to 6716. The SD60M units totaled 44 units and were numbered 6763 to 6806, all of which came from the Big Blue. The SD60Is totaled 46 units and were numbered from 6717 to 6762 and also came from the Big Blue. And if you've ever been confused about the difference between the SD60Ms and the SD60Is, let me clear up that confusion for you right now. 
The SD60M has the basic EMD wide cab of the 1990s as shown here while the I in SD60I stands for isolated. This means that the cab, sometimes called a whisper cab, was insulated from sound and vibrations using a system of gaskets. You can see that crease from the gasket system on the front of the nose. Central Pennsylvania Railroad history changed yet again as the first match set of new power for the coal trains to the Montour Steam Electric Station operated into the plant. Under the cover of darkness, the NS7024, the NS7033, and the NS7025 pulled 130 cars of coal into the plant. These units replaced the ex-Conrail SD60Is that have held this assignment since the NS takeover. The units replaced Conrail SD40-2s which replaced the ex-Penn Central GP38-2s that handled the coal since around 1974. NS has to assign specific units to these coal trains with modified cutout pilots due to interfering with the rotary dumper. On March 8, NS train number 534 had NS locomotive number 7641 leading the NS 7688, the NS 7034, the NS 6730, and the NS 6735 pulling 130 PPLX coal hoppers. The crew dropped the two lead units, both GE ES44 DCs, onto the industrial track at Strawberry Ridge for an NS train 61I, which is the empty gypsum hoppers. This move made the 7034 the first SD60E to go through the Strawberry Ridge coal dumper, beginning another era in power on the coal trains to the power plant. NS intends to change all of the units to the SD60E, which they did nearly two months later, while eliminating the SD60Ms and SD60Is from this assignment and retire them, which they also have done. Prior to the 1980s, northeastern Pennsylvania was a tangled maze of railroad lines. At least eight Class 1s, by early 20th century standards, came to the anthracite region to claim their share of the booming coal business. Of course, the whole thing became Conrail on April 1st, 1976, but not before each of the individual railroads left their own unique marks on the landscape. Before 1991 and the entry of the Canadian Pacific into the region, today's milepost 683.79 on the Sunbury Line was then milepost 205.2 .2 on the Delaware and Hudson's Penn Division. And though the beloved D&H is now long gone from the area, a few of the relics of the bridge line to New England and Canada still remain. At the Laughlin Road grade crossing, located at the bottom of the northbound Yatesville grade, stands a rusty relic of the way railroading used to be. The single-masted southbound signal once guarded a main line that was double-tracked down to the D&H's Hudson Yard in Hudson, PA, and further down to the Pennsylvania Railroad's Buttonwood Yard located on Wilkes-Barre southwest side. Looking behind us and behind the small valley business park located on Passan Drive, we can see the southern switch of the Yatesville siding. This siding was once part of the double track main line. Notice to the right the decrepit remains of another track, perhaps some kind of industrial siding or lead track. Looking at a vintage photo, we can see the signal in its heyday. Looking further, we can also see the second main line, still intact and in use, and also that industrial track to the right, also still in use. X Reading Railroad GP39-2, number 7410, and Delaware and Hudson Jeep, still in Guilford, black and orange, prepare to head south from the ex-Pennsylvania Railroad Buttonwood Yard. Buttonwood was near the northern end of a Pennsylvania Railroad branch line that extended from Sunbury and into downtown Wilkesbury. Another line, which began at Buttonwood, the Wilkesbury Connecting Railway, bypassed the city to connect with the Delaware and Hudson at Hudson Yard on the north side of Wilkesbury. Local PRR freight would interchange with the Lehigh Valley in downtown Wilkesbury and with the CNJ at Buttonwood. Traffic bound for the D&H arriving from the Pensy interchanged at Hudson Yard, while traffic bound for the Pensy arriving from the D&H interchanged at Buttonwood. The Pennsylvania line continued operations as the Penn Central until the beginning of Conrail in 1976. The Delaware and Hudson purchased the line as part of the Conrail creation and operated it even when the D&H became part of the Canadian Pacific. Today, the line is part of the Norfolk Southern system, having been purchased in 2015. Three Penn Central Jeeps, led by number 2266, pull a Delaware and Hudson train, possibly the RW6, into Hudson Yard in this mid-1970s photo. This train is bound for the D&H's Hudson Yard, which is on the northeast side of Wilkesbury, Pennsylvania. From Hudson Yard, this train will continue south via the Wilkesbury Connecting Railroad to the Penn Central Line, eventually reaching Sunbury and the Penn Central Buffalo Line. 
Penn Central Power was frequently used in pusher service on northbound D&H trains bound for Lanesboro. There, the Penn Central Power would wait for the next southbound D&H freight and work in pusher service. When southbound RW6 arrived at Lanesboro, the D&H units would uncouple and move to the rear of the train, serving as the pushers. The PC units would serve as a head in power as the trains moved south over the Ararat Mountain and through the Lackawanna and Wyoming Valleys to reach Hudson. The D&H Power, which had served as the pushers, would then be ready to pull the next northbound D&H train. The Delaware and Hudson acquired the Penn Central Wilkesbury branch as far as Sunbury with the creation of Conrail in 1976. The track it's shown in the photo today is now the property of Norfolk Southern and serves as the river line to the Buffalo line in Sunbury. Delaware and Hudson Alcos marched by the Main Street crossing in Music, Pennsylvania, elephant style in the circa 1980 photo. The trackage in this photo was also used by the Central Railroad of New Jersey between Hudson and Minooka Junction to reach its station and terminal in Scranton. Once the Erie and the Lackawanna also used this trackage, but when the Erie and the Lackawanna merged in 1960, Erie trains no longer needed to use this route, using instead the former Laurel Line from Wilkesbury to Scranton with trains moving to Binghamton or to New Jersey using the former Lackawanna main line. I don't think anybody would have predicted back in 1976 when Conrail was formed that years later in the 90s, you'd still be seeing Reading Railroad diesels in their original paint leading mainline trains. Well, as evidenced by this picture, that's very much the case. How the CSX ended up with this and other Jeep 39-2s like this is an interesting story. Back when Conrail was formed, there was hopes that the Reading Railroad and the Erie Lackawanna could stay independent of the Conrail merger by hopes of the Chessy system buying the two and providing second providing a, second, a competitor to Conrail. Well, that didn't happen because labor unions and Chessy couldn't agree, so Chessy pulled out of the deal. In a last-ditch effort to provide some kind of competition for Conrail, the Delaware and Hudson doubled in size. It was given the Sunbury line from pretty much from Hudson Yard and button from Hudson Yard all the way down to Sunbury from that point on it was given trackage rights over Conrail into Harrisburg Philadelphia Oak Island and Washington DC the Potomac Yard when Potomac Yard was still there when the Canadian Pacific took over the D&H in 91 the Jeep 39-2s still in their Reading Railroad paint were transferred to the CSX Something else interesting about this photo. Take a look at that yellow railroad crossing sign. Note the flashing lights, the flashing yellow lights on the top and the bottom of that sign. I've never seen that before. But as you can see from these other pictures, the x rating Jeep 39-2s weren't the only green diesels that made it onto the D&H and in the Binghamton area during that time. The neighboring New York, Susquehanna, and Western seemed to have a fetish for x Burlington Northern locomotives particularly their wide-bodied EMDs. The 6642 is shown here with the 7412 in Binghamton Yard. The 7412 was built as Reading Railroad number 3412. It became the D&H 7412 and later became CSX 7412 when CP took over the D&H. And as long as I'm running my mouth about the D&H, I might as well tell you how they ended up with this particular engine. When Conrail was formed and D&H doubled in size to try to give it some kind of competition, which we know how well that went, the D&H was given a batch of locomotives from the Lehigh Valley and from the Reading to compensate for that new trackage. And what's funny about it is this, instead of all the garbage that everybody thought they were going to get stuck with, the D&H got the Lehigh Valley's and Reading's newest locomotives, particularly the GP38-2s from the Lehigh Valley and the GP39-2s from the Reading. So that's kind of interesting. What's even more interesting, or at least just as interesting, is the neighboring New York, Susquehanna, and Western and their little fetish for Burlington Northern Diesels. In addition to the wide bodies, they also uh, acquired a smattering of SD45s from the Burlington Northern, like the 6513 that you see here. It was built as Burlington Northern 6513 in June of 1971, and it also spent time as Montana Rail Link number 360 and the New York Susquehanna, it eventually became the 3624. Now, I'm assuming that the Montana Rail Link had it first. What matters to me is that like all of the SD45s that came from the Burlington Northern, it ended up in yellow paint and with the Suzy Q number, as you can see here. But getting back to the 6513, or I should say screen right, 
the uh, X D N H bicentennial diesel there that I'm sure you've noticed at this point. At this point in the game, is looking pretty derelict, as you can see here. As you know, it wound up being reincarnated as Western New York and Pennsylvania, number 406. And although it's long since lost its celebrity status as a red, white, and blue bicentennial diesel, I do believe that the Western New York and Pennsylvania has done a really nice job refurbishing this locomotive. I mean, it paints in good repair, it's shiny. Best of all, it's now a remote control locomotive. I'm not sure where they use it at, but as you can see by this um, uh, radio control pack here, and check out those headlights. I've only ever seen headlights like that one other time, and that's on the Reading Railroad 2102, the ex Reading Railroad, ironically, 2102 that's working the Altoona Juniata shops. And one last little tidbit before we wrap up this video. We talked about this little industry a couple of videos back, and I want to thank all of you who reached out to me and pointed out the name of this industry. If you haven't read the comments, it's called the Broom County Cold Storage. And as you can see, it's sitting right next to the former Delaware and Hudson Yard. Now, the reason I'm bringing this up is because I found this old photo that I thought you might find interesting. This is around 1989. And that train that you see with the Suzy Q power, it's actually a Delaware and Hudson train, but the Suzy Q was operating the DNH at this time. If you don't know that story, back in 1984, Guilford bought out the Delaware and Hudson and added it to its collection of railroads. That, that would be Timothy Mellon, and uh, basically destroyed it. So much so that the DNH was shut down. The, I'm talking about the entire railroad now, was shut down entirely. For at least 30 days. That's when the, new, the state of New York decided to sell it off. And I know for a fact that the Providence of Worcester tried to buy it. And I think maybe the Geneseo and Wyoming Corporation tried to buy it. But there were two short line slash regionals that tried to buy it. But ultimately CP got it because they were a class one. The train that you see here is a southbound coming out of Albany. And it's going to be coming into the East Binghamton Yard. Nay Conklin Yard. Which is where the D&H resided at that time. The yard is still here. The one that you're looking at here is still here, but it's not used for much of anything except storage and as a run-through track for trains to and from Binghamton and Albany. But that spur that you see off to the right, that's the Broome County Cold Storage Spur. Now, I don't know if it was called Broome County Cold Storage back in 1989, but that's certainly what it is called today. With the ditch lights flashing and air horns blaring, trains through Sunbury like our Train 11Z must negotiate close to a dozen grade crossings, none more than a few hundred feet apart from each other. Since train speeds through Sunbury are moderate to slow, it can be a real bane to early morning commuter traffic. I don't get the impression that the people stuck at these crossings are enjoying this show as much as I am.